Napster, Kazaa, and BitTorrent are peer-to-peer file-sharing systems. In these P2P systems, nodes need to find each other. Users need to be able to search for files that exist across the system. P2P systems are decentralized, so these routing problems must be solved without a centralized service routing traffic. Without the centralized service that has all the information in one place, how can you solve these problems of node discovery and file lookup? This is the central question that Petr Maimunkov sought to answer with Kademlia. Kademlia is a peer-to-peer distributed hash table. Kademlia implements the put and get operations of an efficiently scalable hash table without using any centralized service. Each node in the system maintains its own routing table. When a user queries the system, which is the get operation, that query is serviced by the nodes coordinating with each other to intelligently route the user to their target location. When a file is stored, this is a put operation, the update to the file system can propagate through the network in a decentralized, uncoordinated way. Petter joins the show to give a brief history of P2P networks and explain why he created Kademlia. He also explains what he's working on today. We are hiring for Software Engineering Daily. The jobs include writers, researchers, and a videographer, and several other jobs. You can find them at softwareengineeringdaily.com slash jobs. Some of these are part-time, some are full-time. If you're interested in working with us, then check it out, softwareengineeringdaily.com slash jobs. And you can also post jobs on our job board if you're hiring people and want to get at our Software Engineering Daily audience. It's easy and it's free. You can just go to softwareengineeringdaily.com slash jobs, and it's quite straightforward on how to post a job. Citus Data can scale your Postgres database horizontally. For many of you, your Postgres database is the heart of your application. You chose Postgres because you trust it. After all, Postgres is battle-tested, trustworthy database software. But are you spending more and more time dealing with scalability issues? Citus distributes your data and your queries across multiple nodes. Are your queries getting slow? Citus can parallelize your SQL queries across multiple nodes, dramatically speeding them up and giving you much lower latency. Are you worried about hitting the limits of single-node Postgres and not being able to grow your app? Or having to spend your time on database infrastructure instead of creating new features for your application? Available as open source, as a database as a service, and as enterprise software, Citus makes it simple to shard Postgres. Go to citusdata.com slash sedaily to learn more about how Citus transforms Postgres into a distributed database. That's C-I-T-U-S-D-A-T-A dot com slash S-E daily, citusdata dot com slash S-E daily. Get back the time that you're spending on database operations. Companies like Algolia, Prosperworks, and Cisco are all using Citus, so they no longer have to worry about scaling their database. Try it yourself at citusdata dot com slash S-E daily. That's citusdata dot com slash S-E daily. Thank you to Citus Data for being a sponsor of Software Engineering Daily. Petar Maimunkov is the co-creator of Kademlia. Petar, welcome to Software Engineering Daily. Thank you for having me, Jeff. We're talking about Kademlia today, and Kademlia is a core component of peer-to-peer networking. That's the application that Kademlia is most commonly associated with. What is a peer-to-peer network? Okay, so the way I like to look at it is in the form of a distinction between peer-to-peer software in general and what you otherwise known as cloud software. And the distinction, I'm using this sort of familiar terms, but the distinction is sort of more general uh, and it's the following. So peer-to-peer software, regardless of what it is, is always comprised of multiple computers, so multiple computing entities, which all run the exact same algorithm at the start. Whereas, and a good metaphor to remember this is to think of a a colony of ants, where all worker ants 
have the exact same DNA, end up, of course, uh, doing different roles, but they all are equal at the start. And contrast is with cloud software, which is also called distributed software or distributed algorithms, where, again, you have like a collection of computing devices, but every single one is running different software, has a different purpose, and importantly, there is a hierarchical control structure implied. So a good example of this, metaphorically, is a human shepherd is controlling a dog which is controlling the herd of sheep. So you have different species with different DNA, so they have completely different specializations, and there is also, as part of their specialization, there is an implied hierarchical control structure with the entity on top. So in the cloud software, the human happens to be the coherent kind of business workflow that the company wants to implement in the data center. And the hierarchical relationship is that, you know, usually this is all encoded at some high level uh, orchestrating software, which runs other pieces of software, which do like specific data processing tasks and so forth. So you have the two worlds of multiple species controlling each other in a hierarchical way versus identical species that participate kind of democratically, everybody on their own, but they follow the same algorithm, so they end up doing something useful as a whole. Right, so peer-to-peer networks are more of a flat structure, at least from the from the, start. the beginning, yes. from the start. Yeah. Right, and then they may develop certain structures where nodes in the network play a bigger, some nodes play a bigger role in the network than others, but foundationally, there there's a flat structure. Right, and a priori, it's not known who will become an important player because it depends on how they interact with the environment. Whereas with uh, you know cloud software, it's it's set up front, who, which is the you know the the master, and and which are the workers, basically machines. Yeah. So if you in a cloud software, you might have an application where there's four different services, and then you've got a database service and the database service services requests from all four of the other services and so the database service is probably a priori a much bigger player in the network actually actually no so i would put it i actually had it's a good thing you gave this example what i mean here is the the layers of control if you look at the company holistically so the services that you mentioned in your example as well as the database are all applications that are running inside a cluster. And the cluster itself is managed by an orchestrating software which starts them in the first place. Ah. You see? So this is a higher level of control. So, I see. Uh, and so the point is that... So from a, maybe from some application point of view, the database might be more important. But if you, if you really look at like all the way, the entire software stack all the way to the human operators. It's called a stack for a reason. The stack is the hierarchy of control, basically. Mm -hmm. It's more about the central planning from that perspective. Right. No, you're exactly right. The simple point here is that central planning always creates a hierarchy of control because that's just the nature of it. Mm -hmm. So that's a good way of putting it, yeah. Right. The earliest peer-to-peer systems that reached widespread application that I know of were things like Napster, Kazaa, LimeWire, these distributed file sharing systems. And I'd like to talk through these as an example of an early application of your distributed hash table technology, Kademlia. And I want to start with the technologies that came before Kademlia, which is that you had peer-to-peer systems that were built with a centralized database like Napster, and then you had peer-to-peer systems that were built with a technique called flooding. Explain the peer-to-peer technologies, the peer-to-peer stacks that were used for this role of the distributed file sharing network that came before Kademlia, and what were the pros and cons of those systems? Right. So the first one was Napster, and this was simply the model where you put the whole database of songs and the locations of their files, you put it in one computer, and all the clients, all the users would access this one computer as a database. And the drawback of this at the time actually was more legal than computational, 
I mean, nowadays, someone might say this doesn't scale, but actually back at the time, uh, the, the real problem was that a subpoena was sent to the address of the Napster company and a subpoena essentially uh, suffices to, to stop the software, you know, the service until further resolution. So actually at the time I was thinking that the subpoena process, so the creation of peer-to-peer -peer systems, at least the reason I created Kademlia initially was both to create scale, but also to essentially make the subpoena process uh, language inapplicable. Because if you had a service that, or, or applicable in a very difficult way, so if you had a service that was sprawled across a thousand homes, it would be much, especially across different uh, legal boundaries, it would be very difficult to subpoena all of those. So at the, at the time, really, it was more about resilience towards kind of legal boundaries to, to make it more, to make systems like this available in multiple regions, basically. Yeah. So the next technique was this flooding, which I think is the multicast kind of methodology. Can you explain what flooding is? Yeah. So I should back up to say that the main computer, sort of the, the main sort of computational you know, benefit of talking about these peer-to-peer -peer systems flooding or DHTs yeah. is after all indeed that like you get to have much more space as you're using more computational devices. You have replication, so some pieces might be available in multiple geographic regions, but the, but the big point is that you, you get all this new space. And the problem, so you can describe many more songs and sort of save them in this communal memory, which is much bigger than just one, one computer's memory. Now, the issue that comes with st storing information, though, is, is how do you retrieve when you're looking for something specific? And this is when the distinction comes between flooding or other methods. So all, I would say that, first of all, all peer-to-peer -peer technologies generally disperse the information of the database that they are memorizing. They disperse it evenly across its nodes. And the differences have to do with how do they kind of market, tag it, so that they can find pieces efficiently on a query. So the typical, because they're simply key value stores, in other words, they just save some data under a given string, usually the, the, the query simply find the data associated with a given string. And so how the finding is done differentiates flooding from other algorithms. Flooding is the simplest algorithm. It's the first one that appeared in a peer-to-peer -peer system. And flooding simply meant that every node in the peer-to-peer -peer system would ask every other node that they're connected to. And this would continue until it floods the whole networks and collects all possible answers, basically. Mm -hmm. So the commonality between Napster and which was the centralized database and flooding, which is the I guess there's no centralized database, but you have to ask everybody. So it's you know every query is you know you have to query n all n nodes in the system potentially or something on the order of n. But in each of these systems, we've got the same basic setup, which is I didn't really discuss. But in all the all you have a bunch of MP3 files, for example, and MP3 files are kind of big, so you can break them up into chunks and allocate them across the network. And you know, if I've got a little bit of extra storage on my computer, maybe I store a chunk of an MP3. You know, if you've got a, a slightly bigger uh, you know, set of space, maybe you can store a larger chunk or a, a, a multiple sets of chunks. And the real difficulty is how do you have efficient lookups of those chunks? How do you retrieve those chunks efficiently and have those chunks addressed in hopefully a distributed way so that the network is resilient to any particular node going offline and the queries are faster? But it underlying it, the storage system is kind of the same for the different peer-to-peer uh, -peer network technologies that we're talking about. Is that right? Do I have a, a correct understanding? Yeah, so the setup is the following. Usually, the actual songs are present only on computers that uh, people actually care to have them. And so, I mean, I'm, not, I'm ignoring optimizations just to like see the, the clean model. Sure. Songs are where they're being used by somebody, so on a, some subset of users for any given song. Now, if, if a new user wants to, uh, to, to find a new song and download it, they 
make a query that contains the name of the song and what they're trying to get in return is the list of people who currently have the song. So really they're looking up in this meta table where under the song name you want to have a list of every person that currently you know has the song on their computer. Now what you described about chunks this is an additional layer of optimization which kind of goes beyond so this is completely separate it just is the notion that the files themselves might be separated into smaller pieces right and instead of looking up you know different algorithms might also cache them on additional nodes that are not necessarily listening to the songs so the, and then the only modification happens is that in your algorithm is that when you look up a song you're not asking for the people for the files for the people who have the files and are listening to them you're asking a slightly more technical question you know where are all the people that for any reason might have a, even a piece of the file yeah. but this is an optimization you know having to do with like efficient kind of storage storage yeah In today's fast-paced world, you have to be able to build the skills that you need when you need them. With Pluralsight's learning platform, you can level up your skills in cutting-edge technology, like machine learning, cloud infrastructure, mobile development, DevOps, and blockchain. Find out where your skills stand with Pluralsight IQ, and then jump into expert-led courses organized into curated learning paths. Pluralsight is a personalized learning experience that helps you keep pace. So get ahead by visiting pluralsight.com slash SE daily for a free 10 day trial. And if you're leading a team, discover how your organization can move faster with plans for enterprises. Pluralsight has helped thousands of organizations innovate, including Adobe, AT&T, VMware, and Tableau. Go to Pluralsight.com slash SE daily to get a free 10-day trial and dive into the platform. When you sign up, you also get 50% off of your first month. And if you want to commit, you can get $50 off an annual subscription. Get access to all three, the 10-day free trial, 50% off your first month, and $50 off a yearly subscription at Pluralsight.com slash SE daily. Thank you to Pluralsight for being a new sponsor of Software Engineering Daily. And to check it out while supporting Software Engineering Daily, go to Pluralsight.com slash SE Daily. We've outlined the problem that we're trying to solve. Whether we are trying to address specific problems mp3 files or we're trying to address chunks of files across a distributed storage network we're just trying to address something we're trying to build a system where if i want to find a specific mp3 that is stored somewhere in the system i'm first of all i'm going to have to know if that file is on the system i'm going to need to you know to, to kind of understand if there's a, the presence of the file but if I know that the file is present, if, if I have some way of searching for it, I also need to know who to ask for that file. Because if we've got a peer-to-peer -peer network of, of millions of nodes, the whole idea of peer-to-peer -peer is that I don't have to be connected to all of those nodes. I can ask a node in the network to find the adjacent nodes and ask their adjacent nodes and then you know those nodes to ask other nodes. And there should be some way that... I can locate where in the network the file that I'm looking for is located. And this is the challenge that you are solving with the Kademlia algorithm, the Kademlia algorithm for a distributed hash table. And if I understand it correctly, the role of the distributed hash table in a peer-to-peer -peer network is to be a routing table. It's supposed to help you understand where to find information in the network. It's not like you're storing the information itself in the distributed hash table. It's actually the other way around. So okay. the core algorithm is a routing algorithm, which we can describe. And this algorithm is in service to just providing a data abstraction to the programmer, which is exactly the same as a hash table. But they call it a distributed hash table just to, to indicate that it's implemented in some peer-to-peer -peer way. But really what's happening is that we have a routing algorithm, which is the implementation 
of what's otherwise known as a hash table. Because hash table is a data service, it has two functions, put a value under a key and query, is there a value under a given key? So that's just like the semantic meaning of a hash table. It's, it's a question answer thing. But you can view it as a, as a data model, basically. It's a table that has two columns. The first column is the key, which is a string, and the second column is the value. So the routing algorithm is an implementation of a database, of this hash table database in a peer-to-peer -peer system. So maybe I can try to tell you how it works to see. Sure, but just to be clear, so am I completely mistaken that the routing table is core data structure for the, the Kademlia network? The routing table is a core data structure for the Kademlia algorithm, which is a routing algorithm. Right. This routing algorithm is, is, is that can be used directly as a, it can be reused basically as a hash table, but, but this is a second layer. This is the application layer basically of the Kademlia story. So from the point of view of a user, you really, uh, so a user is somebody who's sitting on one computer. From their point of view, if they're, if they're using the Kademlia library, they just say join network and then they have the two functions that they can apply against the network. Store a key value or query for a key. So yeah. what they see as a programmer is it's just service interface with basically a database, simple database interface with a store and a retrieve function. So that's what the user sees. But what's happening inside the... the so the question is how is this database implemented? And this is where the Kademlia routing algorithm comes into play. Because the idea is that the Kademlia... So let me try to explain it briefly. The, the Kademlia algorithm tries to basically imagine a hypothetical, uh, spa, uh, hypothetical space, like a high-dimensional di high hypercube, for instance. Uh, but it's some high-dimensional space that is... Or you can think of it like a sphere, a high-dimensional sphere. And then... It's, it basically, every node that joins the network gets a random address. So it's like uh, on the sphere. So it's like, a, this is a mental model. So they just get a, a, an address where they live in this imaginary sphere. And so we associate uh, keys with a, any string key that the user might try to put in their database. We associate the string key uniquely also with the location on this hypothetical sphere. And we simply postulate that whoever, which, whichever node is closest in, on the sphere to the key is the node that I should try to find and ask about the key. So this would be the node responsible for these keys. And the, the, reason, the reason why we, we need the hypothetical sphere is because every node, just like it works on, in social networks on the globe, every person knows uh, people that are near them geographically or near them contextually, like for instance, uh, job-wise or language-wise. But one way or another, they have these local links. But if they want to uh, send a letter, so this is the famous social experiment, uh, if, they want, if you want to send a letter to somebody far away, it's enough to uh, say the name of the person, the country, uh, something general about them and just pass it on to one of your contacts that is roughly going closer and have them just keep passing through local contacts until they get to the destination. And so we create the exact same situation but in an imaginary sphere and everybody's contacts are the, uh, are the nodes that are close to them on the sphere. We're just creating an imaginary world so they know how to route through it. Okay, so... I want to make this less abstract for people. Sure. So let's say I log into a peer-to-peer -peer file system that is using a Kademlia distributed hash table. When I join the network, I get assigned a node ID. I find other nodes somehow. Describe what happens when I onboard to a Kademlia network. So to onboard, you have to have a connection to from outside to, a, to somebody who's already in the network. So you onboard through another node. 
And during the onboarding process, so the purpose of the onboarding process is so that you become a member of the network. So to become a member of the network, you need to accomplish two things. First, you need to pick an address for yourself, which is usually some random number. And so this places you kind of, this gives you an address in this, in this space of participants. And then after you have the address, you need to establish contacts to a small number of other participants. And these are contacts that you're going to be maintaining over time. So these are going to be your neighbors, so to speak. So they're going to do favors for you in terms of routing and, and you will reciprocate. But now who your neighbors are, this is essentially the content of your routing tables. Who your neighbors are, initially you get help from the node that introduces you to fill your routing tables. So they, when you're being introduced, you pick your address. Your address essentially determines who are the people that are near you currently in the network. So the person, the contact that is introducing into the network will actually query the network for you, find the IP addresses and generally information about the nodes that are closest to you, to your address, deliver it back to you so you can populate your routing tables with information about your neighbors. And from then on, you're independent because you are now alive in the network and you have physical, which usually means, you know, TCP, contact to your neighbors in this address space. And you can just keep maintaining this over time, basically. Once I've joined the network, I can find other nodes. I also need to be able to find files, or I need to be able to locate, or I need to be able to help service a query. If I am just a node in the peer-to-peer network, I now have my routing table that tells me how to find certain nodes in the network. How do I locate another file or what role do I play as a node in the peer-to-peer network in finding files? Uh, Every node essentially uh, services requests for finding files. Uh, And these requests come from your neighbors or actually they can come from anyone. So the way it works is that somebody says, I'm looking for a file with a given key. And all you do is that you look at all of your neighbors and you see which neighbor is closest to the key of the file and you forward the question to them. So that's the algorithm. That's all everybody does is they, they simply forward the question to whoever neighbor is closest. And finally, the person who, the, the node that actually produces the answer is whichever node ends up, whichever node actually sees that they have the file itself on their storage. So every node either every node essentially first checks whether they have the file in their database of, of the, in their file system wherever they store it, and if they don't have it, they forward the question to a neighbor that is closer. And if they don't have a neighbor that is closer to the file address, and they themselves don't have it, it means that the file just doesn't exist in the system. Yes, and. That would be the get operation. If, we, if we're if we thinking of Kademli in terms of the distributed hash table, somebody issues a get operation for a movie or for a song or whatever file they're looking for. They issue the get operation to any node in the network, and then the get operation effectively propagates through the network. Yes, but the important point is that it propagates efficiently, so it doesn't end up flooding, because uh, if you remember the rule is, if somebody doesn't find the file or the value or the key onto their own node, then they forward the question, but they don't forward it to all of their neighbors, which would be flooding. They forward it to the neighbor that is closer to the key, so they only forward it to one neighbor. So the query goes in a in a path towards the destin towards the the node that would have it, as opposed to flooding every time. Yes. Okay. So the get operation for a hash table is is typically has the parameter of a key. So the key might be the name of the movie. Let's say it's Titanic. Titanic.mov or Titanic.mp4 or whatever it is. Yeah. So 
the result of the get operation will be the actual file. So if we say if, if the parameter is a string with the name of the file and the result is going to be the file, we have this this key and this value and the so let me just correct you the result is not the file what okay. so first when you when you have a, mo a query like titanic the, uh, or, a, or or this might be a file name whatever it is it's some textual key this key first gets converted through a, just a, a hash function into a number and this number is exact is a number in the same space as the keys of the Kademlian nodes so this is because you want to have a connection between the address of a node and these keys. And so they both have to be numbers. So you, re so you reduce the textual query to a number. This number is treated as an address, just like the addresses of the Kademlian nodes themselves. And then you simply postulate that you're looking for the nodes whose addresses are, are closest to the address of your query. Mm -hmm. The key space gets broken up among the nodes based off of the different numerical ranges. So Titanic is going to hash to some specific number, and that number will be in some key space. And then the key space, again, is, is broken up across the network. How is that defined? How do you balance the key space among the different nodes in the network? So the key space in general is something huge, like let's say it's 160 bits. This is an enormous huge key space. And then the question is, how do you know which keys go to which nodes in the network? So the answer to this question varies dynamically. So the, the answer simply is, whichever nodes are currently alive and are closest in terms of their key, so the address of a node is, is their key, so whichever nodes are currently alive and are closest to the key for a query, or they are the ones responsible for this query. So uh, we can just say numerically uh, closest. It happens to be a geometric notion of closeness that's a little bit more elaborate than numerical difference. But for the sake of this uh, discussion, it's enough to say that the nodes whose own addresses are numerically closest to the keys, they are responsible for that particular key. So uh, does this make sense? Yes, it does make sense. The missing piece mm -hmm. that I don't understand yet is if I make a query to the network, there's some deterministic routing that allows me to to find the file Titanic mm -hmm. based off of how that Titanic query consistently hashes to a node that's going to lead me to to wherever the Titanic file is close to. I'm having trouble connecting how the file, the location of the file gets, you know, when I join the network, my routing table is established and then I upload Titanic, right? So, so it's, I'm having trouble connecting the fact that if I have Titanic, if I've uploaded Titanic after my routing table has been established, how is there a connection between the key space? Like when somebody enters in a query, I think I know what your confusion is. So okay. because what you call to upload Titanic yeah. is actually a two-step process. Okay, the put operation. Yes, I think you're conflating basically so the, the, the actual file versus the indexing. So because when you're uploading, okay, so let's start from, from what happens. When you upload Titanic, when you hit upload on your application, under the hood, two things happen. The file is already on your computer, so maybe it just gets declared as it's being shared. But the more important thing that happens is that you actually, your computer using Kademlia finds the other node, the node closest to the, to the notion Titanic. So it, it creates, it computes the key for the word Titanic. This is the file that is pre being uploaded on your computer, but you have to tell the network that you have it. So you actually have to store a key under the Titanic key. You have to store the information that you, you are being identified however you want, IP address or otherwise, mm -hmm. that, you have, that you have the file. So mm. the, the, the information of storing this meta pointer towards you, yes. th this is what the Kademli algorithm does. And, and this information is not going to be stored on your computer. Your computer says, 
uh, initiates the storage operation, but this operation is going to trickle through the network until it reaches the node in the network which happens to, to be responsible for the key space uh, yes. around Titanic. So yes. that, that's how you inject the information. I understand. Yes. So to try to rephrase what you just said, so if I'm going to upload Titanic, I am going to perform the same hashing operation to figure out what is the number that maps to Titanic, and then I'm going to find the nodes in the key space who are responsible for the tight where wherever the file Titanic falls in that key space, and I'm going to tell them, hey, I've got Titanic, and if somebody in the network wants Titanic, you tell them to go contact me. Yes, you basically leave an envelope which says Titanic, you know, on the outside, and on the inside it says how to find you. So anybody who's looking for Titanic, they're going to also end up discovering that same node that's responsible, and they're going to look at your envelope and just uh, see where to go next. Does Kadimlia account for the fact that when people are looking for a file, they don't often know exactly what the file name will be? In other words, like they need to search, they need to do some kind of fuzzy matching. Does Kademli itself account for that? Kademli itself doesn't. So Kademli is an exact... Uh, is an exact search due to the hashing function that's uh, applied to the to the query. So people use combinations and sort of compositions of multiple instances of Kademli or just just different namespaces of different key spaces to to create indexing effects. But in general, th there's a limit to this, which is purely information theoretic. So. This is actually the reason why the first uh, file sharing systems were not uh, a very high quality product. There was a lot of noise because you could only find things using exact matches. And later with the ad advent of Google, it became clear that in order to rank, to get meaningfully ranked uh, searches, you, you need sort of structural semantic information. And this is kind of beyond Kademlia, so. Stop wasting engineering time and cycles on fixing security holes way too late in the software development lifecycle. Start with a secure foundation before coding starts. Active State gives your engineers a way to bake security into your language's runtime. Ensure security and compliance at runtime. A snapshot of information about your application is sent to the Active State platform. Package names, versions, and licenses. And the snapshot is sent each time the application is run or a new package is loaded so that you identify security vulnerabilities and out-of-date packages and restrictive licenses such as the GPL or the LPGL license. And you identify those things before it becomes a problem. You can get more information at activestate.com slash SE daily. You want to make sure that your application is secure and compliant, and Active State goes a long way at helping prevent those kinds of troublesome issues from emerging too late in the software development process. So check it out at activestate.com slash SEDaily if you think you might be having issues with security or compliance. Thank you to Active State for being a new sponsor of Software Engineering Daily. If somebody logs onto the network, they're looking for Titanic, they search the correct, or they don't search, but they enter the correct name, they enter Titanic in the specific way that it's indexed in the Kademlia network, and they are routed to me. They, they ask the network, and the network finds a path to me and says, hey, this guy has Titanic, go ask him for the file. Then the person asks me for the file. I've got a uh, a movie file that I'm going to give them. How do they know that I'm not going to give them a virus instead of giving them the actual Titanic movie? Well, they don't know because this is this is just implied in the interaction. So they're looking for something that's advertised as something. I mean, there's no so the short answer is they don't know and there was a lot of sort of bad content and viruses that were being spread 
using precisely what you're describing. So, so, so the way the way things work now, that uh, so nowadays, the mitigation of false content happens from the way in which you discover the files. Because nowadays, people first look for on the on the web for a ra rankings of let's say BitTorrent uh, uh, files, which are ranked according to their BitTorrent, uh, they're described through their BitTorrent addresses. So first you benefit from Google's ranking on those. So you, you actually are getting a, a highly vetted uh, BitTorrent uh, link. And then you go to BitTorrent and you're not, uh, you're not looking for Titanic anymore. You're looking for a specific BitTorrent source of Titanic. So you see, you find the quality, so you, you create the, the, the step where you want to uh, find a sieve out a quality link happens on Google and then you go to a file sharing system already knowing which file you want, you know, represented for instance with a BitTorrent address and then and then the Kademlia network is just used to find this specific file. So the file, usually the BitTorrent files are also uh, the, sign so when you discover the file on google you also discover the signature of the file's content so when you eventually when you download it from BitTorrent you know you can verify that you're getting the content that was advertised on google so th that's why it works today so peer-to-peer -peer systems never actually fixed the problem of finding quality uh, right. information they just became systems for looking up specific file replicas identified essentially by their content digest so like a short right. yeah and you actually use google to rank through these uh, just through the meta information and i think this gets at what you've said earlier that kademlia has a scope kademlia itself is not a peer to peer network it solves a problem within a peer to peer file sharing network it solves the problem of a distributed hash table yes and so things like building a search index or ensuring that the file that gets delivered is secure and is not a virus those are not exactly in the scope of kademlia yeah not at all not at all yeah so when kademlia came out this was 2002 and it was revolutionary in how fast it could route people to the right location what was the public reception to it in 2002? What were the early applications of it? I think the, one of the earliest ones was uh, my friend Jet McCaleb's eDonkey file sharing system and then Overnet. And I, I believe from there it, it uh, started spreading to most of the other clients. Right. Now, people uh, today often associate Kademlia and other peer-to-peer -peer systems with Bitcoin because it's kind of the trendiest application of peer-to-peer of -peer networking, but Bitcoin itself does not use Kademlia. Bitcoin is a peer-to-peer -peer system, but it uses flooding. Why does Bitcoin use flooding and not Kademlia? So Bitcoin is solving a different problem. So the, the Bitcoin, Bitcoin is peer-to-peer is -peer at the level of the exchanges. So all exchanges talk to each other as peers, meaning that they have to you know, replicate it, or rather just the replicas of the, uh, the replicas of, a, of the chains, in a, even in a single exchange or across exchanges. But there is fewer nodes, so these are usually like, you know, company or corporate nodes that like have a lot of resources to store the whole blockchain. There, so there, there's a small number of them and they all have to have the entire database, uh, the same copy of the entire chain. Whereas in Kademlia, uh, everybody has a piece of the database and nobody has the whole so that you can benefit from as much storage as possible. In the blockchain setting, you're not trying to benefit from storage because everybody, at least all the exchanges, want to have the entire uh, blockchain there. Really, And so then the algorithm is completely different because there's no need for looking up anything whenever you want to make changes you have to tell all of the other participants or if you have to re reach a consensus of some sort you have to essentially talk to all of the other participants because that's the definition of consensus so it's a different application but it is peer-to-peer -peer in the sense that they're all equal and they behave according to the same rules against each other nobody is more important than the other ipfs does use kademlia ipfs is a system that 
has a cryptocurrency associated with it, but IPFS itself is not a currency. Why does IPFS use Kademlia? I mean, I believe that um, they use it for the same, uh, without going in, uh, in, in, in great detail, because I'm not familiar in detail, but they generally use it as in, Similarly to the file sharing case that we discussed, but essentially, yeah. essentially they can. So they have lots of files that are stored on different uh, people's machines, and then they have meta information which says where the files can be found. Well, this meta information is essentially key values. That the key is the file block, and the value might be where it's stored. So they use the Kremli algorithm precisely to index those. Uh, most likely and they probably they have probably more sophisticated users on top of this but this is uh, likely a, a good example at some point in your career your focus shifted from distributed hash tables which are commonly used for these decentralized distributed systems and you started focusing more on centralized infrastructure you worked at DARPA you worked at Google for a while Tell me about that shift in focus, going from the world of decentralized distributed systems to the centralized distributed system world. Mm -hmm. Well, so my longer term vision for, so I think both peer-to-peer -peer systems and distributed systems essentially embedded in nature. So distributed systems just correspond to kind of coherent uh, organisms, so animals, whereas uh, social interactions between them with using social protocols correspond to essentially peer-to-peer -peer systems. So in the software world, you want to uh, have both uh, if you want to. Uh, so peer-to-peer -peer systems with Kademlia, it became clear that they're possible because uh, you were always a little timid to even believe that it will work at scale that the math will work, but it, but it worked out. But then the longer term vision is now peer-to-peer -peer systems have to connect a very intelligent nodes that are not just routing and making a hash table storage. And so, so let me give you like a, an example of what this vision looks like. So every person could potentially have their own uh, cloud application running in some commercial cloud of their choice, Amazon, Azure, or some in some other country. And this uh, cloud application can be essentially their uh, digital represent their representation in the digital world in the following sense. It can first of all do services for them, like for instance, backup everything that's going through their uh, personal devices, as well as it can represent them through protocols in interactions with other people's personal cloud assistants, essentially. So these interactions can be much more com so much more complex than just uh, doing either just file searches or uh, crypto transactions, but in general you can you can have a, a, a simply a, a standard where people can have okay so this representation in the cloud. But but now because it's pretty clear that uh, even for your own personal kind of node representation for your presence in a peer-to-peer -peer system nowadays just running a single computer doesn't capture everything that you might want to do people uh, are sophisticated users of the internet now and people manage databases and uh, they provide services to other people so an individual has to be able to modularly build sophisticated applications that represent them in a peer-to-peer -peer society on the internet. So how do people create sophisticated, fully kind of self-sustained, requiring no personnel software? That's the question of essentially uh, building distributed systems. So, but the reason I got interested in this is because companies build distributed systems and sustain them because they're able to benefit from the uh, op people, uh, engineers like uh, operations engineers who continuously fix problems that are not fixable automatically. So in some sense, corporate software is always leaking and there's uh, lots of people on staff to, to make it work. You cannot afford this if you want to build a personal uh, cloud application because uh, by definition, every individual is just one person. So they need to be able to reliably create modular applications in the cloud that represent their interests without needing the sophistication of a whole company. And I believe this is possible. I believe that the, through proper uh, 
engineering methodologies and techniques, in particular languages and other such techniques, it is possible to make uh, programming of large distributed systems simple and safe the way uh, programming for a single application used to be for a single computer. Why the focus on the languages? The idea of looking to a language to simplify the interaction with distributed systems? Well, a language is simply a development tool that uh, allows you to uh, sort of compose lots of pieces together and kind of gives you some uh, facilities to make sure that they fit well so that you're managing your, your things. It basically kind of lets you know when you've made a mistake in your own kind of designs. So languages, so uh, ultimately uh, the language is the, is the point where the author, so in my example, maybe a person who tries to build a, big, a cloud application, the author expresses themselves themselves to the machine. So the language is what faces the human. So f first of all, by virtue of this, it has to be, you know, useful and, and natural. Now, there's another detail, which is that people like, uh, people like to think in one language. And generally, when people switch between languages, whether it's natural or programming, inefficiencies arise because the languages pre present different mental models. So I think a lot of people hold the opinion that in a hypothetical world, ideally, everything that you need to express to make a program run should happen in one language because this is the most effective way both for the programmer to express it, but also if, some, if a software is expressed in multiple uh, languages, there is no tool that makes sure that the things, that the parts that are in different languages uh, talk coherently to each other. Because such a tool would essentially, so people use sort of uh, ad hoc solutions, like they define protocol languages for, the, for, for connecting technologies and so forth. But this complicates the process. If everything is in one, in one language, one is able to kind of have an end-to-end check of, of a large system directly at compilation time, as opposed to writing integration tests. And I mean, the simple answer is that languages, different languages mix mental models. And ultimately it has become, I hold the opinion that actually there is only one mental model that describes all programming workflows. And so this is simply essentially directed acyclic graphs, uh, which is from the compiler point of view, this is known as the SSA representation of functions, which means it stands for a single static assignment. But the bigger point is that it's a dependency graph, a, a data flow of calculations. So this is the basic way in which we describe com co computation under the hood of any programming language or under the hood of how higher level cluster pipelines are, uh, are created. So there is a, um, a uniform way, semantic, behind how we build things. And it's not reflected in a technology because technology grew over time and that's why it kind of is, is, is very disparate. All right. Well, interesting answer. I want to close off with just a, a broader question. So the two biggest distributed systems communities today, I think broadly speaking, you could say are Kubernetes and then the cryptocurrency ecosystem. You have these uh, two disparate communities and the Kubernetes community is is vibrant with corporations that are looking to revamp their infrastructure, they're looking to revamp their operations, and there's a whole lot of money going into Kubernetes for those reasons. And then you have the cryptocurrency ecosystem where they're trying to reframe the entire way that humans do transactions throughout the world, uh, as well as you know the, the immutability and the append-only and censorship resistance and so on. Is there any overlap that you see between these two communities um, that has been interesting to you? Because, I mean, maybe maybe they're, they're totally disjoint and it wouldn't make any sense for there to be overlap, but I, I just see it as, as strange that, like, I went to KubeCon, I think, I think you were there, or, may, or maybe you didn't go, but in any case, it was strange. Like, you, you have this distributed systems conference and nobody was really talking about cryptocurrencies, which, I, I mean, maybe distributed systems is so big that you know, we, we, we need to have sub-conferences uh, within that. But I don't know. I just found it interesting. I don't know if, if you find that thread interesting to pull on. 
I mean, I think that's a, actually a very interesting observation. I haven't thought of it. I'm sure that my partner, Joseph Jacks, my partner in business, is, is, would have an interesting answer to this. My interpretation is that perhaps the cryptocurrency community is not, I'm not, I don't know this for a fact, but perhaps it's not contributing essentially tools for, back into the, into the Kubernetes ecosystem. I don't know if this is the case, but the reason I say this is because the, the tendency is that people who are trying to uh, promote new tools for working with Kubernetes tend to be at these conferences. And I will say that the crypto community in general is interacting at least in, in meetings and discussions with, with um, companies that are focused on building Kubernetes products. But from the projects that um, we have been looking at in terms of tools and the ecosystem, none of them have come from cryptocurrency companies. But cryptocurrency companies are new, so it, I, I suppose they haven't had enough time yeah. to create a, a quality product because, I mean, any tool for Kubernetes probably requires at least a couple of years to come to, to a point of maturity where you would uh, be able to show it at a conference. So maybe this is part of the reason why. Yeah. Oh, we'll see. Well, Petar, thank you for coming on Software Engineering Daily. I am excited about whatever you and Joseph are building. I know it's kind of a stealth project right now, but uh, whatever it becomes, I'm sure it'll be exciting. Thank you so much. GoCD is a continuous delivery tool created by ThoughtWorks. It's open source and free to use, and GoCD has all the features you need for continuous delivery. Model your deployment pipelines without installing any plugins. Use the value stream map to visualize your end-to-end -end workflow. And if you use Kubernetes, GoCD is a natural fit to add continuous delivery to your project. With GoCD running on Kubernetes, you define your build workflow and let GoCD provision and scale your infrastructure on the fly. GoCD agents use Kubernetes to scale as needed. Check out gocd.org slash sedaily and learn about how you can get started. GoCD was built with the learnings of the ThoughtWorks engineering team, who have talked about building the product in previous episodes of Software Engineering Daily, and it's great to see the continued progress on GoCD with the new Kubernetes integrations. You can check it out for yourself at gocd.org slash sedaily, and thank you so much to ThoughtWorks for being a longtime sponsor of Software Engineering Daily. We're proud to have ThoughtWorks and GoCD as sponsors of the show. Wow! 